this morning I would talk about the uh, neutralizing antibodies against botulinum toxin. The botulinum toxin, the most powerful, uh, which we not here, okay. Well, my name is Herr Sessler, this is from NIMS. I will talk about neutralizing antibodies against botulinum toxin, specifically targeting the heavy chain and the light chain of the botulinum toxin. Now, when we talk about botulinum toxin, it's really the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm going to say the good, it has been now used clinically for many years, Botox and all that, and I'm not going to talk about the good side of the botulinum toxin. The botulinum toxin, the bad and the ugly side of it. It is, in fact, what is most powerful and most poisonous toxin on an earth. It's secreted by strains of Clostridium botulinum. It causes botulism in humans, at least seven different serotypes are known, many different subtypes within serotypes. And, in fact, it's one of the most poisonous. You need one nanogram per kilogram body weight will be sufficient to kill a person if given intravenous or subcutaneous route. But even a three nanograms given pulmonary will cause botulism. And that's why, because it is so toxic, it is so easy to produce, it is a category A agent assigned by CDC Atlanta in the US as a potential bioterror agent. The botulinum toxin is a complex mode of action. It causes paralysis. In fact, it causes death by inhibiting the muscles or the breathing muscles of people die because of the uh, paralysis of a muscle tissue. It specifically targets the neuronal cells and it has the ability to inhibit the neurotransmission mechanism. If you look at the events that are happening at neuromuscular junction in the neuronal cells, you will see that the fusion of the synaptic vesicles with synaptic membrane protein and release of acetylcholine neurotransmitter is specifically inhibited by botulinum toxin and tetanus toxin for that matter because these toxins specifically cleave those proteins that are associated with fusion of the synaptic vesicles to synaptic membrane. So this these proteins have very complex mode of action and have a different part of the protein known as, uh, in other words, that the heterodimer. They have different parts of a toxin, each associated with specific mode of action, where the so-called the heavy chain domain is harbored the receptor and internalization part of the toxin, uh, a hundred kilodalton part of the toxin, known as the heavy chain. It records the actional and light chain transportation of the light chain into the inside of the cell, and the 50 kilodalton, known as the light chain, which actually contain this potent enzyme activity, which enzyme activity which cleaves specific proteins inside the cells, whereas type A botulinum toxin and E will cleave SNAP25 protein, botulinum type B would cleave specifically one 2 protein associated with synaptic vesicles. But both of these regions of the toxin are associated for targeting neutralizing antibodies. So in other words, we need to make antibodies to both of these parts of the toxin in order to neutralize the toxin. Now, the, the botulism, the disease botulism is fairly rare, but it's often partial because it's a very uh, potent toxin associated with botulism. We often hear in over the years that botulism is caused by many food injections. When you have wrongly prepared food or canned food, where Clostridium botulinum can grow in anaerobic environments, secrete the toxin, an injection of such food as green olive paste or canned food and shellfish has been known to produce in the last few years severe cases of botulism, but more than increase of botulism associated with heroin uses where the needles uh, and um, contaminated needles have been used. A number of cases have increased in botulism for heroin use. But the other arm of the botulism is a potential biowarfare agent because it is so potent, because it is so easy to produce. The some of the examples where the toxin has been associated with use of potential 
by the record. Done in 1930s in Japan, it has been evident that toxin has been used to experiment on humans. The stockpile on US and Soviet army stockpile have been destroyed in 1970s because they were producing large amounts of octoline toxin. There's an incident back in 90s from Japan where there was an attempt a particular cow to use the botulinum toxin in a, a transport metro station without causing any problem. But there was an attempt to see whether it will be possible to use it as a potential uh, bioterror. And in fact, there was in the 1990s, there was an evidence of a destroying of stockpile in Iran for potential bioterror in the nation. Now, the only treatment for botulinum, whether it be natural occurring botulism from food or whether it be potential bioterror, is by passive immunization and injection of the antibody. And there have been, for many, many years, this antitoxin, the serum horsterine antitoxin, have been produced for many other toxin related diseases, diphtheria, tetanus, to name a few, including botulinum toxin. And the first production in bearing from late 1990s, early 90s, have virtually been unchanged to today, where even today the trivalent ABE host antitoxin is still used and licensed in Europe. Heptavalent antitoxin against all five, seven different toxin serotypes that recently have been licensed in the US. And so all of these available products, in fact, coming from the host, have a potential hypersensitivity serum sickness. The alternative, the only alternative, is so called baby BIG in California. California have a high incidence of infant botulism caused by injection of spores, possibly from honey, where children or babies will inject this honey and get spore forming botulism and have a toxin. And therefore, the infant botulism has, has been treated by this locally produced product derived from the plasma of humans who have been immunized with pentavalent vaccine. It's a very expensive product and only used locally. I've been told that $43,500 it costs to treat one infusion of a product to treat a child, a baby and that. So to elevate, there's no similar human-derived antibodies in Europe for the potential stockpiling of these antibodies and under European project, the biodefense project, the aim was to make a cocktail of these neutralizing human-like antibodies directed against the botulinum, three main A, B, and E strains of the toxin, so in order to use it as a potential for army treatment of the soldiers as a stockpile in the potential use of the army, and also for the treatment of civilian of, of food or other derived botulism. Now, this European project of which 2.96 million pounds were, uh, euros were signed over the four years, is just completed in February 2015, included four countries of the partners, various laboratories from France, Germany, UK from my own laboratory, and Finland were co coordinators of this project which I'm going to summarize and tell you what the outcome of this project will in relation to preparing human-like monoclonal antibodies, recombinant antibodies against botulinum toxin. Now, the, the project, as it was named, antibody ABE, so an antibodies against ABE or botulinum toxin, has a typical workflow, and I'm going to briefly, in my talk, present some of the key deliverables that have been achieved in the project. The idea, the work was to start from non-human primates by immunization of macaque of recombinant non-toxic part of the botulinum toxin. The planning and selection of the antibodies, the in vitro and ex vivo relevant methods to use to select and characterize those antibodies that will be of interest. Eventually, bringing our building up to IgG, making even few superhumanization of IgG, and finally confirming whether these antibodies actually protect animals in vivo. 
Now she said she started off from six different antigens, the six different antigens, two per A, B, and E toxin. And you have a very similar protocol. We give an example of one of these antigens where the animals, the non-human primates, macaques, were immunized with different, um, with different times of this recombinant protein. And then different times after immunization, the animals were sampled the blood serum. The blood serum was sampled to see whether the animals are hyperimmunized. And bone marrow was selected for the further screening process of the language. So the antibody selection was based on the standardized strategy where you would have the antibody gene library prepared from the macaque gene library. There was selection of antibodies by the panning process and the identification of monoclonal antibodies, looking at their affinities, looking at their specific binding, eventually building the short chain variable fragments or the bivalent short fragment of this similar to IgG in order to analyze the, what they're able to do. Now, a typical like, results of the how reactivity and counting of the phages at a panning stage, I'd like to specifically say here that there was well, the reason of using different uh, subtype of the toxin at the panning stage process in order to select potentially cross neutralizing antibodies. As I said earlier, the botulinum toxin have different subtypes within each of the serotypes of toxin. So for example, the toxin type B will have subtypes of at least B1 and B2. And during the panning process, we use not just the recombinant light chain of the antibody, the non-toxic part of the toxin, but also the fully active toxin from the different subtype to be able to select those antibodies during the four rounds of the panning process, which were the most likelihood to also cross-react and therefore potentially cross-protect against different subtypes. Now the next, the next part of the study was to select so the in vitro and in ex vivo assay, that's a relevant assay that could be used to select the short chain fragments which would potentially have neutralizing properties. Now first of all, I'd like to say that because the botulinum toxins of the, have particular enzyme activity, we were able to use a method previously developed in my laboratory which specifically is able to detect the botulinum toxin are very simple in vitro assay using ELISA type of assay format. Now it was possible to modify this assay specifically to see whether we were able to select those short chain fragment antibodies. We have ability to inhibit this enzyme activity. In other words, the enzyme activity of a specific light chain only of the antibody alone. So this method allow us to screen for this short chain fragment antibody we have in vitro inhibiting property. A typical results of here of this in vitro inhibition study demonstrated where this is a typical titration ELISA assay where you have a toxin alone. The toxin alone will cause a high signal in the ELISA assay indicating the toxin is spreading. But if the antibodies are able to inhibit this activity, you will see a range of profiles for different antibodies. The higher dilution at which the antibody, the short chain fragment antibody or the bivalent version of the antibody is able to inhibit this activity in vitro, the lower dilution curve is obtained. So we were able to say a range of these antibodies would have ability to inhibit in vitro activity. Now this, in summary, we have published a couple of papers on this work specifically showing that the short chain variable fragment can inhibit in vitro enzyme activity with a particular molar ratio, which can be substantially increased if these antibodies are expressed in bivalent version using the same epitope of the same antibody now expressed in the bivalent form of the chain will increase the, it would increase the molar ratio of a toxin and antibody, but also we were able to select 
the antibody, they give very favorable Mona ratio of inhibition using such an approach. Now, the next question was to see whether these antibodies that can inhibit in vitro activity also can neutralize the toxin. And by that, we mean can these antibodies also prevent the factor of the toxin other than the enzyme activity light chain. And for that purpose, we use an ex vivo mouse nerve assay, which we previously published. It's a relevant model to look at the effect of toxin on the muscle isolated training nerve hemidiaphragm muscle, which is put here in an equipment and connected to stimulating recording um, equipment which, which monitor, the, monitor the activity of the muscle twitch. Now, because the toxin causes paralysis, the toxin will eventually paralyze the muscle and the twitch of the recording will be reduced. But if the antibody binds to the toxin, it is able to reverse this paralysis in effect, and therefore we're able to use this model to see whether selected antibodies are able to inhibit the toxin activity. Now, some the typical results of such an in vitro assay was showing that when a toxin alone is given to the tissue, it could paralyze the muscles within very quick time. And this is a time in minutes where 50% paralysis, the muscle will get paralyzed if an antibody has no effect on this um, muscular paralysis. They will give a very similar profile to the toxin alone. But if an antibody is able to prevent the toxin by binding to the toxin in such a way it would increase the paralysis time and the more paralysis time is increased the more potentially potent the neutralization of the antibody is. So in that method we were able to demonstrate that these antibodies are also able to inhibit ex vivo antibody response in terms of being taken off to the next part of the study. In similar way, using this kind of easy in vitro methods, we were able to screen large number of short chain fragment antibodies in the system and only select those which inhibit this in vitro enzyme activity to confirm by building up into the bivalent format also by this ex vivo assay for a whole range of different antibodies against different subtypes of the toxin. So this method has been proved to be very useful as a screening strategy of, of uh, tiered strategy to be able to confirm potentially neutralizing antibodies. But not only that, it was able to show that cross-inhibiting antibodies have been uh, selected. We were able to show that the same methods have been applied by using different subtypes of a toxin. In this case, the B1 subtype of a toxin where the animals were immunized with B2 subtype to show that we also have cross-inhibition and cross-neutralization by neutralizing properties of these antibodies against different subtypes, proving that the initial panning and selection process has worked because we have selected only those antibodies that are able to cross-react with different subtypes. Now, having selected a range of these antibodies for the uh, study of the project, the next was to see for germline humanization of the antibodies. I'd like to say an example here, given some results of the example of looking at botulinum B light chain of how this has been done. Now, the goal of the project to, to reduce potential immunogenicity of the antibody when we have the a therapy of the antibodies of the non-human origin, there is always a potential that these antibodies will generate an antibody, an anti-antibody response, and the consequence of this is that you have loss of therapy. There will be reduction of the therapy because of a long-term use of the antibody. So the idea is to look at the human germline genes and to see whether these antibodies can be improved and making their sequence changes within the framework region of the antibodies that will make them more human in nature, more human sequences. We're looking at the not changes in the more hypervariant CTR region. In other words, I would like to give an example 
Again, how this was achieved, but really comparing the sequences of human germline sequences for selected uh, antibodies for this particular short chain version antibodies to look at those areas of the framework region within the human germline which are most similar and the most aligned to the region of the selected antibodies. And this is an example only at the looking at variable, high variable region of the antibody heavy chain. But in order to use this approach to calculate the so-called germinality index, germinality index where you can, co using computational analysis to compare similarity between these sequences in the framework region that are most similar to the human to do, uh, to, do, to do selected antibodies and calculate overall for each of the variable heavy chain or the variable light chain, the percentage similarity which align and make these antibodies most, or how similar, make this indication of how similar they are to the human German sequences. Now, having established this, you can see that there's the original version of the short chain variable region antibody had a similarity to human germ of 86 to 87 percent. The humanized version of the antibody will be much improved, and now by making amino acid substitution and changes in the relevant framework region, it would increase the percent similarity for each of these antibodies. And the summary results of that of humanized, making humanized variants of each one of these five selected antibodies targeting the botulinum A, botulinum B, heavy and light chain, we were able to show that for each heavy and the heavy chain um, variable region and heavy chain light the region of antibodies, in each case we were able to increase the germinality index, the similarity index in the sequences between the antibodies and the human germline, making them human comparable with human native antibodies, which potentially make them more usable in therapy should they then be developed for therapeutic use. Now finally, the main part of the study was also to assess in vivo protection studies. The studies were to confirm whether these antibodies actually also protect full animal, whether full animal in vivo. And there is a key part of the, of the project was to see are these antibodies useful. Now, as a first stage of the human, uh, as a first stage of verifying the effectiveness of these antibodies, the first stage to see whether these antibodies are able to protect. We use a model we previously developed in my lab, which is more human model, looking at the local effects of botulinum toxin. What this means that the botulinum toxin when injected in small doses locally is able to induce flaccid paralysis. And we're looking at sub little doses of a toxin and we're monitoring the extent of the flaccid paralysis induced by the botulinum toxin. This flaccid paralysis can then be prevented if an antibody is able to inhibit the toxin activity now in the whole body uh, animal rather than ex vivo in the tissue of the assay. So this model was used as a first step to confirm whether the antibodies have ability to protect in vivo. And this is an example of a result again of the in vivo protection using this so-called paralysis model as opposed to the mouse lethality model. We use a paralysis model to confirm whether when you inject the toxin, in this case the A1 botulinum toxin, when you inject this toxin into the mice, into local region, they induce a paralysis which we monitor from a strength of the one of zero to three is an indication of the extent of the flaccid paralysis induced locally. Now when we inject the antibody together with the toxin, 
some of the antibodies that have previously very effectively inhibited in vitro would now only partially protect. What that means is that they might reduce the severity of the effect of the toxin, but they were not completely, even at the higher doses, they would not completely protect the animal, which limits, in a way, a single monoclonal antibody to have an effect to completely protect from toxin effect in bees. But some of these um, humanized IgG version of the antibodies at higher concentration did protect the animals, but at lower concentration would only reduce the severity. However, when you make a mixture of the antibodies and combine the both antibodies against two different parts of the toxin, we did confirm that anti-light chain and anti-heavy chain immunoglobulin combined are indeed protective at much lower doses. And in fact, we have shown that in fact the synergistic effect of the antibody for toxin therapy is very important. Now the next step of the study was to confirm whether this is also happening in mouse lethality assay, the mouse LD50 test looking at systemic toxicity of botulinum toxin. The botulinum toxin, when injected into animals, were caused death within 24 hours at this concentration, the LD50 lower toxin. We have to show that for both A1 and B2 type of botulinum toxin, we were to inject different doses of the antibodies, looking at the anti-heavy chain and anti-light chain antibodies alone in each case. And again, the antibody alone are only, might protect at the higher doses, but they will only reduce the severity of an effect against the mouse. But only when combined, but combining again the antibodies against the heavy chain and the light chain, we were able to confirm full protection of the animals, confirming that indeed the combination of both antibodies can not just prevent paralysis in vivo, but can prevent full toxicity in the mouse LD50 test. Now, to the overview and success of the antibody ABE project has been, if we're looking at over the four years of the project, I'd like to use this slide to summarize what I have just said, but also to summarize what the project has delivered. We have provided provision of the antigens to recombinant and starting material, not toxin, heavy chain, a light chain of a toxin will produce the macaque non-human primates were immunized with this non-toxic recombinant protein. Libraries were constructed from the non-human primates. The antibodies were um, generated after the panning process. The panning process had taken into account the cross-reacting and selecting cross, potentially cross-neutralizing antibodies. We've used a range of in vitro and ex vivo methods that were relevant to detect ability of these short chain fragment antibodies to inhibit either the enzyme activity in vitro or to inhibit um, ex vivo effect of whole toxin. Before we were able to select a single antibody from each group to put them forward to the production of IgG to improve their humanization profile, and finally confirm that by relevant in vivo protection studies, protective antibodies were generated, and particularly the protective antibodies in pairs were generated against all three botulinum toxins, which was the aim of the project. Now, um, in conclusion, we confirmed the success of this strategy based on targeting different functional domain of botulinum toxin and to use the non-human primates as in a new library to generate human-like monoclonal antibodies against which are powerful neutralizing antibodies against the botulinum toxin for the first time in Europe. Um, 
I would like to thank you for your attention, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge there were a lot of people being involved in this um, four-year project. The whole different laboratories in Europe participated in the study. There were people from my own group whose job was to select the use of relevant assay to confirm the insulation properties, to particularly Michael Hoost from Germany, who is a molecular biologist, has done the germline sequencing and preparing the antibody IgG fragments to the people in the Ministry of Defense in France who have performed the immunization studies with monkeys and have uh, screened and been processed to the people in, who have prepared the original reagent and contributed in providing the relevant strains of the toxin. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention again. There are many points. Uh, so my first question is, uh, I see the effectiveness, especially of the combined uh, antibodies, and how well it worked in not only preventing, if administered first, but in recovering an animal that was paralyzed. I see that. And then have a single antibody. No, with two. With two, with two, yeah. with two yeah. it was very effective. Yeah. But wait, but my question yeah. is, yeah. what about in a warfare, a bio-warfare yeah, 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 yeah. situation, what do you think about the possibility of developing a, re a botulism toxin that is resistant to these antibodies? If someone is preparing, do you think that these are always effective or it would be possible to select for a resistance? Yeah, well, I think that's a very relevant question, and this project didn't answer some of these questions. I think what we have really done is to see that these antibodies are potential. But what, in order to answer this question, when it needs to be done and the different routes of slaughter. So, in other words, particularly in a warfare, you want to see whether they were protected in the inhalation of toxins. And in different models, there has to be also, you will have to attach the range of higher concentration of toxins. So this is being a um, proof of concept study at this stage to say, well, these antibodies have potential. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done now to address whether they will actually work in a certain setting and particularly whether they will protect against different things and will depend that they have the antibodies in the world. So, so I think that there is the, before this I have one more question yeah. uh, moving towards actual clinical application. Yeah. Have you considered the large scale manufacturer? Have you been looking at how to uh, introduce it to a, a platform for large scale manufacturers? Well, this is again a point I'm going to stop you now. Moving on, but where they will cover it as a 
about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just go ahead. Just That's answer the question. Don't want to repeat it too often. I was wondering about the total uh, subcoding the uh, CDRs into a human immunoglobulin mm -hmm. gene. Mm -hmm. but then, of course, as you say, yeah. one is not enough. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have three or four different ones, you can't do it with one. I mean, you can't do it with one. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it might not be three, but every case is three. I mean, let's say two or two means two, but you might need more than that. And yes. when you need more than that, it becomes expensive. It becomes difficult to do. And uh, from production point of view, I mean, I don't know much about that. But I mean, you know, I think that we do. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I just, I can just say it doesn't work. And does it work as good as what we thought? Yeah. Now, uh, what we thought worked. I mean, I don't know, in the US, they, they just recently approved the product. How much you actually have stayed on the good sickness problem? And again, you know, I think that they have reduced, they have been reduced now with more suicides. They cannot make it only bad food of the polystone. Um, but on balance, you know, it's been an interesting exercise. But to produce something in that program where we've got now that we can come with an antidote is too much. Yeah, we, we, need, we need to set, and that makes that, that's yeah. why I think the main question people ask, you know, why we haven't actually got the product on market. Yeah. And the answer is, they don't work that way. <laughs> I mean, they might be, maybe for the stereotoxin. We're working now on some other toxins now. And uh, the stereotoxin are the easiest. Um, the quantitoxin is just working. Um, Pepin. Yeah, but uh, that's the, I mean, obviously, companies like Botox, uh, Allergan, and other companies, they make these products. They make it very clear that nobody will be able to benefit from this wonderful botulinum toxin therapy. I mean, botulinum toxin is now used widely. I mean, I didn't go into that, but I mean, they exponentially use it. And that's some companies they use. But in fact, they do work against various lot of conditions and not just um, um, specialized eye or originally like the 20 years ago, but the actual microstructure that is used for uh, relieving the muscles, you know, mimic muscles, it is used quite a lot. Now if you go to the back thing of everybody, and there is a back thing, obviously this therapy was not long ago, mm -hmm. and so this is very clear, back thing is in everybody. This botulism is still quite rare. I mean, it, it happens in Japan. In Japan, there's a very good product as well against the pentastic problem. In Japan, there's the egg toxin. Um, uh, you know, so it's not a, something that people suffer from greatly. And you would, I think that that thing is obviously considered for military. And there is a nice thing available for military as well. Uh, but it's not very good that. It's uh, very um, inactivated, the top story just from out of hand. You know, uh, it's a skin, it's not an option. Uh, <laughs> I know I <I'm> it. <laughs> it's uh, not the best of the product around. And uh, obviously, antibody therapy is an ideal. Can I ask how different subtypes are? Um, how variable are they with the sequence yeah. level? Um, at, at the sequence level, how different are the different subtypes? How different? Oh, yes, some of them are more similar than others. Uh, for example, the type A toxin might have seven different subtypes. Mm -hmm. Two or three of them are quite similar, and some of them are more different. So it's a different, different uh, parts of the um, chain. So, um, in fact, one of the conditions of the security was there was non disclosure mm -hmm. of the antibody population. It might be possible to get a cross-reactive antibody. Yeah, but as I said, you know, that, that was part of the security call was not to disclose the information whether these antibodies would not protect against certain subtypes. <laughs> but polystone generally do. But even polystone antibodies might protect less against some subtypes than others. Are there any 